We also love Ralph because he can change slides for us. <laughs> it reminds me of a story of when um, Value Village first did the move, move into Washington, D.C., where I'm from. They literally had a store across the street from a Goodwill store. The average shirt price at the Goodwill was $3. Walked across the street. I'm just a customer, not working for Goodwill or anything like that. And so, so the Goodwill price was $3. The Value Village price was $6. So I found out what they were doing was using the Goodwill store as a wholesale place and just bringing the stuff across the street. And where were the crowds? At the $6 place, not the $3 place, because they knew, to Ralph's point, that the value was always going to be over there. It wasn't about the price. It was about the experience and everything else. Okay, some of you may have seen this presentation before. The good news is, it's the same 50 lessons. I haven't changed this in the last couple of years. Okay. Uh, why should you listen to a guy who's CEO? I've never worked in a thrift store. Okay. I've sold shirts and ties in a men's store back in the day. But what I did do was I worked at Goodwill Industries. And I was there for 21 years. For five of the years, I was in charge of the retail consulting service at the national office. So my job was to be able to take information from 2,500 Goodwill stores, see where the trends were, make tests, see what was working, what wasn't working, take out all the excuses like Ralph was mentioning of what they thought was working and put it into numbers. And to be able to hire people who are store experts, like we have Lori now, thank God, to be able to go out and to help the underperforming store stores to improve. So what I'm telling you is not just Dave's view of the world, there might be a little bit of that in there, but it's really, materials that I'm sharing with you that I've learned as a result of that experience in Goodwill based on not just one set of stores in one community, but stores across the country, and by testing things. So there'll be a lot of data-driven things. At the end of this presentation, you'll have several different critical measures, as Ralph was saying, what gets measured, what, what gets done, is what gets done. So I'm gonna give you a couple of benchmarks that you can use. You'll see that you're not probably at most of them. That's okay, it's a place to start from. Um, so let, let's take a look. Quick origin. In 1902, a Methodist minister named Edgar Helms found that he was getting a lot of stuff helping the, in South Boston, helping a lot of the immigrant population that was there. He was um, going door to door asking for money. The problem was it was a recession during that time, and people said, well, I don't have money, but I can give you stuff. And so he was taking coffee bags and getting stuff from people, and he said, well, I want to give it away. So he, took, he went to the back of his church and laid out clothing on the pews. It created a feeding frenzy, like sharks, okay? <laughs> of people coming in and just tearing the stuff apart, grabbing it from each other, and so forth. But the big aha moment was when a little old lady came and gave him a coin and said, I can't just take charity. I, I, it's much more dignified if I can pay you something. So he took the coin and the Goodwill store model was born from that, recognizing that, hey, if I can organize this stuff and put it in a dignified atmosphere where people can purchase it, then it's good for the organization and it helps the people we're serving be better. So they started from a model which we've now <coughs> moved away from, which was let's provide clothing for the poor and other household goods and so forth. And they hired poor people to be able to come in and work in the back room and fix furniture, repair on a radio, there weren't any TVs back then, sew clothing to repair it. Uh, they would wash and dry every piece that was donated. And it was the, the, the worst business model you can imagine, putting as many hands as possible on all this stuff before it got to the sales floor. Why? Because they would take the money they earned from the stores and create wages out of it. Some people would work for clothes. You could do that back then. Say, if you'll work for me, I'll, I'll give you a voucher that you can go shop in the store for your family in lieu of cash. So they didn't always have the cash. Yeah, that was 1902. <laughs> now, Goodwills have grown by community across, you see them everywhere now. How much have they grown? What will surprise you? When I started working at Goodwill in 1990, there were 440 stores. The average square foot was about 3,500 square feet per store. Now, their stores are owned similar to ours. There's no national Goodwill store organization. They're owned by local kind of like dioceses level organizations and they control their 10 stores, their 50 stores. The national office <coughs> manages the data but they don't manage the stores themselves. By the time I left in, in 2010, a little bit later than that, they had grown to 2,500 stores. But even larger than the growth of the number of stores was you see the average number of square foot. 
So there was a lot of store replacement going on as well as new stores. It ended up being about a net of 100 new stores per year, and every new store that was being built was at least 10,000 square feet, somewhere up to 20,000 square feet. There are old Kmarts that are now Goodwill stores. Now that might include some other services and things, but that's the kind of building that some organizations are looking at now. That tells you not just the growth of Goodwill, but the growth of the thrift model across the country. Because they weren't alone, as Ralph mentioned. There was Value Village and Savers, which by the way are the same organization, um, and a couple of other for-profit retailers. Salvation Army grew. We grew a little bit. Um, every time Goodwill thought the pie was this big, a for-profit thrift guy would come in and show us that the pie was that big. And it's still not there. When I left, we did a study of all the demographics around the country to find out, well, what is the, you know, what, what is the, the maximum that we could be? We found that we could still double the number of thrift stores across the country in any community in the, in, in the land. In Los Angeles, there's more than 50 Goodwill stores. They could have another 50 and still not maximize the potential there. So don't worry about the competition on a retail level. I'll get back to that in a minute. So this you might think, well, that's a you know typical Goodwill store, no, no big deal. Um, but what is an average Goodwill store? When you crunch the numbers, it's a one million dollar social enterprise, hiring about somewhere between twenty five and forty employees. When you include the the donated goods, the truck drivers, the sorters, and all that in the system, and some of the people that they employ are people being served. They call them clients. We don't. Okay. Now here's the one you might want to pay attention to. Across the, the landscape in Goodwill, the average profit margin is somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. So on a million dollar store, what could you do with $300,000 a year? Okay, Fundraising is harder to do than thrift stores, but look at the potential there for dollars. Okay? And if you treat it as a social enterprise, it's, it's an incredible thing. Now, does every Goodwill store make 30 percent profit? They wish. Some make 50 percent profit. That's because they're paying under what they should be paying in the middle of West Virginia somewhere, and land is cheap and those kind of things. Others are doing closer to 5%, 10%. But as a system, not a bad business to be in, right? Okay. The basic goodwill model is make as much money as we can, take the profits, and then do our social services with that income. St. Vincent de Paul doesn't have one model, <laughs> but <laughs> one of the ones that we have is let's give away as much stuff as we can, but make enough money to keep the lights on. That's not a bad thing or a good thing, it's just different. I'm telling you, in goodwill, when you come to a meeting like this, the first thing you say is, hi, I'm Dave, how are sales? <laughs> they start with, with store sales and work backward to everything else. They are very much a retail business that does good things. We are an organization that does good things and happens to have a retail program as well. So it's, it's a very different culture but it didn't start overnight, and they know it's because they know where the bread and butter is. So, we have a, a food pantry in a retail store that I visited. Okay, so again, we're giving away as much as we can in a retail environment. So they're paying retail sales per square foot for the food pantry. That may or may not be a good thing, depending on what square footage goes for in your community, but in a lot of cases, that's probably not the best use of that space. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to have a lot of photos of stores. Some are from the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, some are Goodwill, some are Deseret Industries, from all over the country. Um, I'm not naming names. <laughs> so, so if you recognize it and it's good, you can stand up, but otherwise, don't worry about it. Uh, okay, so lesson number one. And by the way, uh, we have handouts. Lori, uh, can, we, can we get the handouts sent around? Yeah. Um, this is also on the website, too. Um, and they're just phrases like you're going to see on these blue arrows. Number one, know what business we're in. You probably think we're in the retail business, and if that's so, you're wrong. We are in the business of monetizing donated goods. Think of it this way. You can't, have, you can't sell what you don't have, right? And so the competition is going to be about donations. The value is in the donations. Get that right. The retail part, I hate to say it to a room full of retailers, the retail part will take care of itself. But if you think of it first as a donated goods organization versus a retail organization, it changes the culture into what things to focus on and you'll improve. So when you see a room like this, I see money. Okay? Because all that stuff has value in it already when it comes to us 
but it's not making any money back there. It's got to get to the, to the floor, right, and be organized and so forth. But that's the lifeblood of our business, is what we're getting in the back. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of critical measures, as I said, things to benchmark. Where are you and where do you want to go? And these, again, are based on what Goodwill uses to, to succeed or fail. Number one, take the number of retail square feet that you have, multiply by five. That's the number of donors you need to look for in that year. Now, so 10,000 square foot retail, that's 50,000 donations. That donation could be a whole house or it could be one shirt, doesn't matter. But that's the numbers that you've gotta be thinking about. It also doesn't mean that those donations have to come at that store. If your store, let's say you're looking for 50,000 donations and you figure out your store can only do 25,000, well, then you need other donation locations around town to get to that number. The reasons will be more apparent as I go through that, but that's the first thing I'd like you to look at as a critical measure. Second one, sales per square feet. I recommend $100 per retail square foot. When we started this at the, at the Goodwill National Program, we, we, uh, we'd have our national retail conference. To Mark's point, not every manager came, but every retail director came. And we started handing out little trophies for every organization that had a hundred dollars per square foot. The first year we did it, we had seven. By the fourth year, we had 500, okay? Because people saw the number and started to work toward it. And they knew that it was possible because at least seven were already doing it. I talked to a guy just last week who's running um, uh, a new retail operation in Alaska, in Anchorage, $350 per square foot. In Anchorage, you could do that good, right? Um, I don't know what else there is to buy in Anchorage, <laughs> or how often they get to see it, but, but those kind of numbers are possible. You probably don't even know what that number is right now, uh, and you're, you may be calculating it wrong. It's not the footprint of the store, it's the retail footage of the store, okay? Um, next, expense to revenue, another word for profit. Goodwill works towards 70, meaning 70% 70 costs, 30% profit. That's what they're working for there. And again, that's not per store, that's per retail program. So that includes your salvage, everything else. It was interesting, one of the, one of the things that I noticed in looking at all the numbers was in, for many Goodwills, their profit for the year was equal to their salvage sales for the year, within like 1%. Now that means, does that mean you run the stores for nothing? <laughs> no, but the stores generate that salvage to then sell it, and this is where the commodity is, I'll talk about the price going up and down, but often their profit margin for the year was very equal to what they were doing in aftermarket sales. But know what that number is, and work from there. Okay, three biggest factors. We took a look at where do we want to put the next Goodwill store? And, and forgive me, I'm saying Goodwill a lot, but it's that history that I'm sharing with you. They don't know that I'm here, so don't. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the, the statute of limitations has run out, that, that, that kind of thing. Okay, but we looked at 200 different factors as to what made a Goodwill store successful. Based on every manager telling us what they thought was the truth and so forth, we did a multivariate quantitative analysis, threw a bunch of numbers in a computer and a spit out. The only three that made any difference was the store location, the quality of the store manager, which is what Ralph was talking about, and the ability to attract donations. <clears throat> what did this do for Goodwill? It flipped the model upside down. They went from putting their traditional stores in poor neighborhoods where shoppers lived to putting the stores where donors lived. And it changed the world. Okay. Why? Because donors have choices. They can move to other places and, and donate where they want to and so forth. Convenience. Shoppers are in their neighborhood. Uh, poor, rather, the poorer people don't have as many transportation choices and so forth. It doesn't matter to me as a, as a donated goods person if the person who buys that shirt is a poor person or a rich person. It matters that they're giving us the money to buy the shirt. Okay, so if you think from that model, it makes a big difference in where to put the stores. Okay. Store manager and also I would say the sorter in the, in the back room are the ones where I, the, the old adage of you get what you pay for makes the most difference. They said, that manager, and it just happens to be a manager in one of, the, one of our stores, makes or breaks the success of that store. How do I know this? Because again, with all these Goodwill stores, 
We took managers from overperforming stores and put them in underperforming stores, and took the underperforming manager and put them in the, the good stores. The sales went <laughs> upside down. The only difference was the strength of the management. So the good store manager made the bad store better. The bad manager is no longer with us. <laughs> so, <laughs> And to Ralph's point, hold them accountable. Okay, so Ralph said this, I will reinforce it. The donors are always about donor convenience, not how good your mission is. Now, we do have a slight edge. We did, I did focus groups, personally, around the country asking donors, why do you give, who do you give to? Overwhelmingly, in both their behavior and in their, their saying, it was about who's convenient. Now, what does convenient mean? We used to think in goodwill it meant that you had to come to my house. That's not the case. A lot of times I don't want people coming to my house. It's a mess, okay? But, <laughs> but I would like you, you to be on my way to work or on my way to the grocery store or something like that. Think of Beverly Hills. I went there one time. They have a big, as you can imagine, a gated community, right? Goodwill trucks aren't going in that community. So they, put a, a, they took a dry cleaning space in a mall just outside of the gated community and made it into a donation center. So the help would come in and donate all the stuff from those homes where the trucks couldn't go. It was convenient for the family. It turned out to be convenient for Goodwill as well. The edge that we have is that if the convenience bar is equal, people are more likely to give to their faith than any, any other reason. So our affiliation, which obviously is direct affiliation with the Catholic faith, is a very strong motivator for people. Some of the most successful St. Vincent de Paul donation strategies are the truck in the church parking lot because the, the Catholic people will give because they know that St. Vincent de Paul is part of us and they know it's going to help do the mission of the church. So that is one thing we have going for us. Goodwill is no longer considered a Methodist organization. It's back in the bylaws and articles of confederation and so forth. Thank you, pardon. Articles of incorporation, not confederation. Um, but, the, um, but, but the grand is no longer there. Salvation Army is there, we're there. Deseret Industries is from the Mormon Church. They have those advantages that others don't. Okay, so here's a parking lot, and you can see two different types of convenient places. On the left is a uh, traditional drop box, <clears throat> and on the right is something new, which is one of those pods that they've converted into a donation trailer. What's interesting, though, is that they're both from the same organization. Big Brothers Big Sisters owns both of those. And then you see that pod, and it's actually, they had someone sitting in a chair there before I took the photo. So that was actually what they call an attended donation center that was there, and they were testing out the model. Would it make any more sense to have a staff person there and perhaps get bigger stuff than you could shove into one of those boxes? So they're testing that model out, and that's what I would recommend to you. Be in as many community locations as possible, test out what works and what size that you need. Not everyone needs a receipt. In fact, less than 50% of donors ask for a receipt or even want one. So that's not a big driver of getting donations. The best, for many reasons, as we have here with St. Vincent de Paul, is when they bring stuff to you. Think of it from a cost basis. What's, what's better than having a donor bring things to, right to you? You don't have to go out and get them. You don't have to have a box. You don't have to hire a truck driver. You just have someone at the door to accept them. And it's, boom, go right into the store. That's wonderful. So um, having that donation center, in this case, the side of a store, in a convenient location for the donor makes the day. Okay. People ask me all the time, how much should I spend on advertising? You know, that kind of stuff. Well, the best advertising you have is the store signage. So you're driving down a street, busy street, and you see, can you see the St. Vincent de Paul? Their store <laughs> sign? Okay, it's that little blue spot there. Yeah. Well, to, to make it worse, if you're going down that road that's right there on the left, can you see the St. Vincent de Paul store? Yeah. It's above the red SUV. Is, you can barely oh, see it. Okay, that's the view from the road. I mean, you can see my mirror. I'm actually on the road driving by out at a stoplight. That's where the store is. So sometimes you have to advertise your store at, at the store line, but isn't this a lot better? This is a view from the street of the same organization's new store, and you can see that very very clearly. There's a logo, thrift store, tells you what they're doing, shop, volunteer, all that's right there. So much better. When you have this kind of advertising, you don't have to spend money on radio and, 
and billboards and everything else. Put your money where you've already got the real estate. Why buy a billboard? That is your billboard. Okay. Uh, so when you're advertising, I suggest that the best ads that you can make, no offense to Ralph's great commercial that he just had, your, your best ads are for donations. Again, we're in the donated goods business. Shoppers will come, but people need to know about donating. So the reasons why they donate, the convenience of it, the environmental, this, that, and the other thing, um, doing a good thing for people. If you, if you have to spend money on any kind of ads, make them donation ads first. You can tie it back to the store, but the focus is please donate to us. Here's a good example of that. Donate to help a neighbor. Now this is a, obviously a truck going to pick up donations at times, but that could just as easily have been a store ad, truck wrap versus a donation. So that truck is doing its job even when it's not picking up goods because it's advertising to donate every time it's out on the street. Does it matter if you lease or buy a store? No. There are some locations that you can only buy, some you can only lease based on the other neighbors and the owners of the real estate and so forth. I'm telling you in terms of profit margin and operations, it doesn't matter. Nationally, half of Goodwill stores are owned, half are leased. And, and ours within the society are roughly about the same too. Don't dwell on that. If it's a good location, it's a good location. Both of them are completely acceptable. Here's one that's a store that was taken over from somebody else. Um, notice the red logo just says DePaul's a little bit quirky signage there. <laughs> but you take over, obviously taking over some other retail location, it works. Um, this one's a little confusing for people, but if you're in an area where Target has moved in, you might understand it. When Target comes into a community, they will often start four to seven stores at the same time. That way, when they run a TV ad about Target coming, it's spreading it across seven locations and it's costed against seven locations. We can't always do this, but if you're looking at a, at a strategic plan, if you can open more, more than one store in the same media market at around the same time, it spreads the dollars of your advertising, your donations, it's part of your bigger picture. It also helps when you're, when you're planning everything from staff to transportation and bailing and all that good stuff. Not always possible. Um, I get a lot of feedback fighting about this from you guys, sorry, but <laughs> the best retail items on a sales per square foot critical measure, again, is clothing. Okay? Yes, that sofa takes up a lot of space and it sells for 100 bucks, 300 bucks. Clothing is a winner every single day. Okay? So, you might say, wow, we got a lot of space, a lot of good furniture there, it moves and so forth, not compared to clothing in the same space. Don't trust me, trust the numbers. That's the way it works out. Okay? Same with books. It looks great, it looks like a library there. Okay? How much of that, remember in Ralph's talk, how much of that is fresh? Uh, we don't know. But again, if that, if that wall space had been double hanging clothing, it would probably perform better. I'm not saying don't have these things in your store because that variety helps a little bit for the customer experience, but we're in the clothing resale business predominantly. Again, no U.S. market is oversaturated in thrift and retail. You see the different store, there's three different stores lined up in the same place, all different titles, all different owners and so forth. But where we are saturated in some markets is in the donations competition. How do you know that? Well, just take a look at the number of boxes around, how many people are there. And what makes it tougher though is that in some areas stuff is collected and then sold in the value village let's say. They're collected in market A and then they'll truck it to market B. Okay. We have some society locations that only do boxes and do collections and they just sell it all wholesale. I'll talk about that in a minute. But sometimes that, that's, that gives a false picture of how much the marketplace is in donated goods. Um, in Goodwill, we would start a store with a minimum of about 30 to 45,000 people. That was the market kind of saturation that we needed to make a store successful. It was more about though the number of donors than the number of um, shoppers. Once you get a store started, how do you know when it's going to be a, a winner or a loser? Usually within 12 months, you're going to know. I've had some cases where um, people made People made up their startup costs within six months and then they're profitable within one year. And it doesn't always work out that way, but you're gonna know. So that's important when you're doing your leasing and things like that. Yes, does that apply to changes too? If you make changes in your operation, you should see 
Well, I'm assuming you're going to continue to be making changes in your first year anyway, but you're probably going to be close to your, your not your max, but where your expectations should be in the first year. Now, I've never seen a pro forma that I've ever trusted, okay? When I see, this is what the SOAR is going to do in five years, they're always wrong, okay? But this is a better benchmark than those pro formas typically are. Okay. Don't store it, sell it. People say, well, what about my Christmas stuff? Make a Christmas display. If that wreath is a good price and a good value in August, people will buy it. Don't wait till November 30th to put it out there and take up that valuable warehouse space. The only reason I could justify storing some things is if you're in a market, uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota, <laughs> where it's two degrees outside and three feet of snow, you lose those retail days. More importantly, you lose those donation days because I'm not getting out of my car. <laughs> okay. And you don't want to drive your truck to my house. You can't even get to my house. So to store some things there, believe it or not, people will still shop. They go to the grocery store. They do these other things when the weather's bad. They'll come to you. But that would be the only reason to, to even think of seasonal storage. Christmas stuff, Easter. Yeah, you can keep Easter baskets and, and do more of it around Easter time. But I'm telling you, if things are good, things are good. Just sell them. Okay. We need to remember that no value is added to our donations from the time they get to our back door to the, until they get to the front. So what does this imply? Have fewer people touch it if possible, fewer steps in the process, whether it's pricing and sorting and things like that, because none of it's going to make that $4 shirt worth $5. <laughs> so when you see a room like this, the first thing I'm thinking of is, why aren't there any people back here? <laughs> because this stuff is just sitting, okay? Which means it's wasting time, which means it's wasting money. So the quicker we get it out to the sales floor, the better, okay? And there, there are some goodwills, I'll pick on them, where there's a line on the wall in the back. And I said, what's that line there? Oh, well, that was our biggest donation day ever. We had a pile, we called Mount Edgar, and we had it all the way up there. And that stuff was there for three weeks. No, you want to be pushing it out, pushing it out. Keep in mind, you're paying for that space, too. So you want to make it as efficient as possible. Again, like Ralph said, I like to go to the back rooms first and see what's going on. If there's no activity back there, then I know the store's got some potential. Okay. Now, we give things away. We sell things in the society, right? And that's great. I saw the same thing happen, though, when we started with eBay sales, where the store manager was not getting credit for the stuff that gets sold on eBay. So she didn't want people coming through and picking out the best stuff to put it on online sales because her sales numbers were gonna be affected, which affected her bonus. So from that lesson, what I would suggest to you is if you're doing vouchers or whatever through your, your conferences, et cetera, have people shop with dignity through the store and have that number recorded, the value of the, of the merchandise coming through so that the store, in a sense, gets credit for it. That way, the manager won't be fighting the people who are on the mission side. <coughs> Everyone's working on the same team. This is important, especially if you're looking at uh, bonus compensation, which I'll talk about, and, um, and, and just, again, being sure that everyone's on the same team. On the other hand, you no longer have to have loan closets in the back of your churches. Okay? You can just be doing a voucher program to get people <laughs> to go to your stores, they get uh, assuming there's a store nearby, that they, they get acclimated to knowing that there's a store there, they get introduced to the process, they can come back later and shop when, they, when things are better, that kind of stuff. So here's a case where um, it's, a, it's a thrift shop, the pantry, um, warehouse, all kinds of stuff in the same kind, kind of location. Um, that's fine as long as you have the parking for it because it introduces more people to the retail side of what you're doing. Okay. As I said, shopping is more dignified than receiving the handouts. So let's give people that opportunity to shop, even if it's with a voucher. Okay. And who wouldn't want to shop? Three nice ladies there in the store, and, and you know, they're, they're there to help you. I don't know if all three of them are paid employees, at least one is the manager. Um, but you know, who wouldn't want to come into this environment versus going into the back of your, of your church basement and saying, now pick out something, hopefully something will fit, and hopefully the shoes will match, right? So do that instead. I believe we have a great opportunity in our mission to help do stores employment. Okay? Um, we, as I said, every store in Goodwill was between 25 and 40 positions. 
Many of them were competitive hires. Some of them were training jobs so that people could go through, get some work experience, get it on their resume, and then be hired by I don't know, another retailer. Uh, and think of the jobs we have in a store. You've got not only cashier, you've got stock helper, you've got um, forklift and, and hand cart, materials movement operations, you've got trucking, you've got bailing, all that kind of stuff. Those are jobs in, in the neighborhood that other people provide. We have that opportunity, not just as a, any other business of hiring people, but to hire the people that we see coming to us for help and giving them that, in some case, first opportunity. Yes? 25 to 30 full-time equivalent employees, or is that? No, just bodies, just bodies. Yeah, it's less on the FTE scale, because a, a lot of them are part-time. Um, some are, uh, What's the right word? Court appointed volunteers. <laughs> okay. Uh, but still, it's a body and it's a service, right? So we're getting, and we don't have a label that says, hi, I got out on February 4th. <laughs> but, but, but they're working alongside of people, and our, the, the paid employees are goodwill. And they might only be there a couple weeks, a couple months. And then, as part of their promotional plan, we, we try to get them hired into a job that's going to pay even more. That, that's a wonderful benefit when you're going into a community. Yeah, Especially guess. if uh, they, 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 you know, because if they're former offenders, then no one else may hire them. Right, exactly. So we have a chance to interview them and right. get to know them. Right. Okay, as Ralph said, theft happens in all retail. All retail. Be vigilant. Um, and when you see an operations center that looks like this, it's just ripe with opportunities. Everything coming in is one of a kind. No one tracks it. Uh, it's easy to slip something out the back door. I'll tell you in the bar sometime about the horror stories I've seen of fake cash registers, people selling stuff out the back by the barrel and pocketing it, driving entire trucks of donated goods to their house first before they go to the store. That's the level that it can get to, but it usually starts one item at a time for the reasons that Ralph mentioned, justified and so forth. Here's the message. Across all retail, more than 90% of, re of retail theft comes from the inside. So as Ralph said, if you don't think you have a problem, you probably have an even bigger problem. It might be cash, it might be goods, it could be anything, okay? Um, you say, well, those sweet little old ladies wouldn't take it. They don't even know they're stealing. They just say, I, you know, I worked really hard today, no one's gonna notice this salt shaker, and I'll just take it, you know? Or we, we weren't gonna sell this anyway. And, and it, it creates a culture that it's okay. So we just have to be very careful. I always suspect the new guy in the picture <laughs> um, but often, <laughs> none of those ladies are here, are they? <laughs> often it's the employee that's been around 20 years, everyone loves him or her, and everyone gives them their full trust. Now I say that knowing full well that that person might be you. Wow. So if you fit that profile, it's in your best interest to make sure that everyone can see very clearly that you're not the suspect. Okay, what are you doing to prove that you're not stealing? Okay, do you have cash handling that's got several people involved so there's nothing's ever left with one person? Okay, I visited a Goodwill once where the CEO was in on the tape and he would make, be sure that he got the responsibility for the daily bank deposits so he could take some out and rewrite the slips. It's, it's crazy what's out there. So as leaders, you are not exempt from being part of the problem, but you're certainly potentially part of the solution. So um, I hate to say everyone's a suspect, but let's be sure that no one has the opportunity. That's what it comes down to. And you know what? Thieves don't steal the bad stuff. <laughs> they take the best stuff, which means that's profit going out the door. Okay. Um, I highly recommend end caps and tops to racks. Why? Because with the same amount of square footage, um, oh yeah, you know what? Okay, you see the tops here where it's you know hats and belts, sometimes shoes. It's the same amount of square footage, but you've doubled your chance to sell something. Now here they're using it more for display. I don't like displays, by the way. We're in the process of, of we're in the business of selling stuff, not displaying it. And, and if it's one of a kind, if somebody wants to buy this shirt. Heck, if they want to buy the mannequin, the shirt's on. I'm going to sell it to them. So, so I, I do as little of this as possible. But, um, but that's an opportunity to essentially double the, the same amount of square footage that you have. Weekend hours. Yes, I know we're faith-based. But I can also tell you from my experience as a young man working in a 
a men's shop. I made more money on a Sunday afternoon than I made after five o'clock all through the week. Okay? Uh, here's an example of the society's hours 12 to four on a Sunday. Okay, you can work it out. It's easier again, as Ralph said, if you've got paid people versus volunteers, but I would suggest, you know, God bless Chick-fil-A, um, who doesn't open on Sundays, but um, I think it's a necessary part of our, of our retail sales time. Yeah, are you paying a living wage? Ralph said it very well. We don't want our employees to have to come to us for services. Walmart was blamed for that, if you remember, a year or two ago, and they finally started turning things around. Um, are we gonna be paying $15 an hour? Probably not yet, okay, but that might be in our future. So again, how can we be more efficient? How can we make sure that, that our, well, that our, that our people are paid and then accountable and worth that money. It's the same question that every employer has. <coughs> yes? How about uh, health care? How many health health staff offer health uh, We don't have a lot of time to go into it, but what a lot of retailers do, including us, is have more part-timers who are not eligible. So if, the, if your benefits start at 25 hours, you have a lot of 20 hours. It's the nature of the business. Um, we have people working three part-time jobs, no benefits. I really feel badly for that. It's something that each of you need to figure out how much of that you can afford to do. Okay, if you can smell a store, and we know what that thrift store smell is, it usually means that the goods are sitting in the back room too long. Somewhere they've got a chance to essentially mildew. It could be in the truck, if you guys are in you know, 90 degree heat and the stuff is outside in the truck sometimes, it doesn't take very long, okay? As I said, back in the day, Goodwill washed and dried and ironed every single piece that went into the store. Nobody does that anymore. Most of the time when people give us stuff, it's clean. And then we hang it, people wash it again before they wear it the first time. So that's not the problem, it's that it sits there too long. So that, when I walk in and I, first thing I do is a smell test. And then I know if goods are rotated fast enough. Again, if it's sitting in the back here like this, the stuff on the bottom never seems to get moved, <laughs> okay? You're just taking stuff off the top all the time, so that's a, that's a problem. Okay. About wages, what Goodwill found works very well is you pay a wage and then you have a bonus program on top of that. And the bonus program is tied to the success of the store. So you do better as an employee when I do better as a store manager and the store system. It gets people to perform better. Where you really see the difference is in the goods process per hour in the back room. What is that potential? Well, it depends on your pricing system, depends on your tagging system, so I can't give you a number. But when you start paying people per item produced, suddenly production goes up. Okay? So be careful that you're doing it legally. You don't want to underpay them. It's kind of like servers and tips and stuff like that. And it's not like, well, we're gonna pay you this much and then all you can steal. You know, we don't wanna go there. So, so we gotta be careful about that. But incentive programs work from managers on down. Now, every store, every store should also be a donation center. Why not? You, you may think, well, I only have so much space. Well, you can have people bring stuff in the front door. They're gonna do it anyway. So you might as well advertise it. We have people bringing stuff to the national office just setting it outside the door. We don't say donation center, you know, but they see the name and they, especially Goodwill, that happen to buy a national office all the time. Every Monday morning, there'd be 20 bags on a mattress outside the front door because <laughs> they see Goodwill, they think donate. What a nice brand to have, right? In our case, there's multiple brand names, but one of them is gonna be shop and donate for us, especially if you're working that well. So expect it, embrace it, do what you can. Now, Deseret, notice it says right on the sign, thrift store and donation center. How many of your stores advertise that you're also a donation center? And then you don't, you wonder, well, why doesn't anybody donate here often? Well, if you don't tell them that's what it is, it, it ain't gonna happen, okay? Goodwill, it's hard to see from here, but it says up there, Goodwill Donation Center. Now, when you see a store like this, you go, well, where do they donate? I can't even see it. Um, is this a donation center? <laughs> it is, it's one of ours, right next to the dumpster, <laughs> okay? Um, but there, there's signage at least, and you know, you gotta, you gotta live with what you have, so, if, and that's on the, that's, uh, on the end of a, a strip center kind of thing. 
And so there's the opportunity. What makes the difference is if somebody comes out and helps, and it's that experience. But there's plenty of room to park, pull the stuff up, and you're out of here. A better situation is here. You see the, the little new gas station belt. Uh, people drive across, ding, ding, somebody comes out and helps you get, get your stuff out. And it's a donation drive through If you're in an area where there's a lot of rain and snow, this is in uh, Oregon somewhere, um, the roof is really nice because again, people don't want to get out of their cars. But if they know that, hey, if I can drive up to a place like this and it's going to be temperate, you know, those things matter. Some places give lollipops to the kids and a cup of coffee to the driver, think, all these kind of things. It counts, it really counts. But it starts with accepting that your store is a, is a donation location. And then, as I said, if you can't get enough donations at the store, you gotta supplement. Here's a case where a Goodwill took an old gas station. You can see here, this was the service bay and that's where you can drive in and donate or just pull up. There's not a lot of space to park. It's right on a, on a busy street. It's advertising to all the people that aren't donating, though, as well as the signs, Goodwill Donation Center. It doesn't even say store. It's just for donations. So what happens is the guy brings the, the person brings the, the donation to you. And that doesn't happen every minute of the day. So your employee that's there can take those donations and sort of pre-sort them in big Gaylords in between the donors. So they got the clothing here, the, good, the hard goods, the electronics, whatever, to make it more efficient to put that stuff on a truck when they come by, you know, once a day, twice a day, whatever it is, um, to get that stuff back to the store or the processing center. So be looking for those spaces out there. The maxim is that donations are not free. People say that, oh, you work for Goodwill, you work for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. How lucky, you have these stores where you don't have to pay for your stuff. Like, yeah, we do. Someone's gotta pick it up, someone's gotta sort it, someone, there's a truck involved somewhere. All this, there are costs to the donated goods. So we wanna minimize those costs as much as possible. Sometimes we do it in the wrong way because we have 12 volunteers in the back room, none of them are working that hard, and this stuff sits versus one paid person who can move that stuff through and make it happen. Here's a fallacy, that, again, checked through the numbers and the history of goodwill. If stuff doesn't sell in one store, don't move it to another store to sell. It's not going to work. However, with every rule, there are exceptions. And I'm sure you can share them with me, but the ones that I find is, in some communities, you'll have one store that gets known for furniture, somehow or another. And so if furniture doesn't sell in store A, that might be an opportunity if you're not adding more cost to that sofa to move it. The other one that's an anomaly is a college store. If you have a, a, a thrift store near a, a college campus, you can sell those ratty old sofas. <laughs> you can sell stuff that'll go into a dorm room. My son and his, his three roommates just last week bought a sofa for 50 bucks and carried it a half mile to their dorm. At the end of the semester, it gets donated back, and then the next group of students buys it again. You know? It's a golden sofa. <laughs> um, you also sell more jeans and t-shirts, stuff like that. So, so if, you, if those jeans, denim isn't selling that well in your other stores, that would be the only time that I would say it's worth it to maybe move it to a, a college campus type store, because you've got a, a, a different kind of market there. Okay, <clears throat> clearance stores. The guys that are in the hall, will tell you don't run clearance stores, okay? Why? Because they compete with the stuff that you sell at the clearance store. Clearance store is that, that difference between your full retail price and your salvage price. You might move everything to one corner of the store, you might make, have a separate store just for clearance item and sell it a dollar a pound or a dollar a bag. Well, it's a price thing, figure it out. More often than not, it works. What it does though, and what they'll argue, is that it reduces the value of the, the uh, salvage bales that they're gonna get. They're not my problem. <laughs> my problem is making revenue at my store, so that might be worthwhile. I'll come back to that. Now here's a Goodwill outlet store. And you think, oh my God, it's like six floors and three floors of parking. Well, it's really just the first level or two. Above that is some of the Goodwill offices and things like that. But it's on a highway location, great signage, it says Goodwill Outlet. When you have these downtown, especially warehouse stores, there's a, there's a long-standing tradition that they get the best stuff. It's just in people's head culturally. It's usually not true. In fact, as an outlet store, you're getting the stuff that's already proven that didn't sell once. But 
people flock to them. Your wholesalers, your, your eBay guys will flock to them because there's always that hidden treasure that's there. Okay. I would say consider in this day and age, stuff, especially nine clothing like books, art, antiques, consider eBay type sales. I went to a store in Charlotte, North Carolina that had an original Barbie doll. It's a black and white bathing suit for any doll collectors and so forth. And it's sitting in the glass case. Okay. So that store was hoping that in the 30 days that that Barbie was going to be there, that the Barbie collector was going to come to that part of North Carolina, <laughs> go to that store and see that case and buy it. Versus putting Barbie online and the whole world has the opportunity to see that doll and bid against each other for what the value is going to be. That's where we are right now with Amazon and eBay and so forth. I don't recommend it yet for clothing because people still like to try stuff on, and you know, unless it's things like fur coats, wedding dresses, purses, that, that kind of stuff. But for other items, um, again, <coughs> if you create a job, it's not that tough. It's, it's a little difficult with inventory and packaging and stuff like that, but it works. There are Goodwills doing over a million dollars a year just in books, just in books. And with all those, uh, what is it, I, IBDN codes, whatever it's called, you can track. They're coming into your stores now with their, with their phones, putting that number in to see what that book is worth on the open market. And then they're deciding to put it into their basket or not. So you're already part of that system, you just don't know it. Okay, so when you've got, you know, and this isn't bad, if it's multi-hung, lots of purses, I'll show the books and the uh, shoes in a second. You know, you can sell some of those, but how many of those are, are an online purchase waiting to happen? Might, you know, worth checking out. I didn't have a chance to check this at Goodwill because the, the digital age was just coming about with retail when, when I left. Same with shoes. This looks awesome. Are you really gonna sell that many shoes? <laughs> okay, but the right buyer finding them online, wow, who knows? Which leads me to the next part. Uh, racks are great. Display is great, but people will buy stuff right off the Z racks. You know the racks coming from the back. Of the, you guys know what they are. Yeah. Yeah, coming from the back. Not everybody uses them. Okay, so let shoppers have that experience of first to the goods. What we found at Goodwill was people who waited and only put stuff out on Wednesday were giving up about six days worth of retail sales. Whereas if you put as soon as that rack is full, you move it out. Even if you couldn't put it on on the display yet, you just put it in the hallway and people will buy it. Now here's the from. We're standing where those shoes were just hanging. I originally took this photo to tell you that it doesn't matter how bad the flooring is. Don't worry about that. People will still shop. As long as you're not tripping over anything, you're good. But look here. You've got the shoes. And people have already started to pull shoes off the rack. You know, the price is on them. Let them do the work for you. Save a display step. And people think, wow, I got this first. You know, they love that. They love that. OK, how far apart do you put your stores? Well, it depends, we found, on the donor penetration. As I said, you need about 25 to 40,000 people per store to get the donors that you need. But if there are boundaries like a railroad track or a river where people don't cross them, trade barriers, psychological, they don't, they don't go there. I live in St. Louis. Sometimes the, the best store is right across the river in Illinois, but to them it's like Mars. So we don't go there. <laughs> so we go twice as far. Into, into Missouri to buy it instead of going across the river. It's all in our heads, um, but it's real. I would look at how far apart grocery stores are as a model because they, they tend to fit the same general model. Same grocery stores are the same make, I should say. Okay. Okay. I mentioned this before. Stores succeed better in donor neighborhoods than they do in what we consider shopper neighborhoods. As I go around and I try to explain this in my, my very fancy graphics, this circles your donors. This circles your shop. Your uh, sorry. Here's your rich neighborhood, your poor neighborhood, where they come together. That's where you want the store to be, because it's maximum choice for the donors, and it's still easier for people who need to shop where we are. Um, but again, if we're thinking of being in the donated goods business, we're not there to give stuff or sell stuff to poor people. We're there to make money from the stores to then serve the poor people. Um, that changes how you look at stores. Many of you will deal with a real estate committee on the board. So this kind of discussion is very important before they start looking for the cheapest land in town. Or the building where the other four stores didn't make it, but somehow magically you guys are going to do great. Okay. 
Who complains about your prices? It's the people that are shopping you to sell other places. Okay? If you're not getting complaints about your prices, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> okay? um, it's the people that, as Ralph said, your profit is escaping. So many of us price too low. It took the for profits for Goodwill to realize that when they were seeing these, what we thought were outrageous prices. And people say, well, why can I, why should you charge $5, five whole dollars? for a shirt when I could buy a new one at Walmart for $5. Well, if you're selling a shirt that's made by Polo or somebody, it's worth more than five bucks. It's one of a kind, and as Ralph said, you either like it or you don't. The price is the, the least of the factors, but we tend to be oversensitive to price. I'm telling you, please, don't start charging you know, 50 bucks for that shirt, but there's, there's a line there, and it's probably too low right now. The first, when you give a discount or something, the first dollars you give away are your profit dollars. So, it works the other way when you're pricing too low, you're giving up that potential for profit. Okay, I'm gonna really move here. Circle this one on the handout. Everything, I mean everything, should stay in the store no more than 30 days or four weeks. Whether you do it with colors, tabs, or, or markers, or whatever, rotation is the key to our retail success. 12 times a year, Approximately, we're just completely turning over our inventory. Now, again, you're not only putting stuff out on Wednesday, you're putting it out every day. Now, why did we learn that this was the key to retail success and goodwill? Because of numbers 38 and 39 and 40. Of everything you get in donations, no matter how good you are, you're only going to sell about half of it. You don't know which half of it, <laughs> but you're going to sell only about half. And of that half, half of that amount is gonna sell in the first three days that it's on sale. We did this with a lot of barcoding, very expensive metrics and so forth, so trust me on this, it's the statistical data. 50% of everything you're gonna sell in that store sells the first three days that it's on sale. 75% of everything that you're gonna sell sells in the first two weeks. After that, I call it garbage time, okay? so. To 41 here. Therefore, the last two weeks that it's on sale, that's when you can discount. So it might be four weeks, full price, full price, 50% off, make me an offer, <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, let the customers clean their racks for you. Hopefully, at the end of the fourth week, there's that color's not around much anymore, but that's when you can discount it. If you discount too early, you've given up profit. But if you know those secret numbers of how often this stuff is going to sell, that can maximize the profit for you, okay? So your unit price are good, better, best, I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. What I can tell you is that when you do good, better, best, it takes you longer to process an item in the back room. Time is money. So with a few exceptions, I prefer personally unit pricing. If you've got something that you know is just a really good brand, a really special piece, per coat, let's say, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna special price that. Some with furniture too. Most of the time, unit pricing. I've been in the back of stores and had a board of all the different brands. Uh, you know, good, better, best. And there was like 300 brands up there. Who's got the time to look that up each time? You know, after a while you remember some of them, but you know, most of the time it, it's not worth your time to do that. So just flush it through. We're in the, we're in the bulk processing business. So again, Moving this stuff, getting it on a hanger, getting it out as soon as you can is, is what we do. And again, no employees. When I talk about decentralized versus centralized, this is, do I move, if I'm collecting, let's say, household collections, do I take the stuff to the stores or do I have one processing center and then it moves from there to the stores? Typically, across the country, we found that decentralized is about 30% less expensive than a centralized operation. The anomaly is if you're in a, in a particular city with, with a real estate issue where you can't afford a bigger store with a big enough back room, it's more efficient for you to have one giant operation center where donations come in and salvage comes back to and that's where the bailers are and the trucks come to, then it makes sense. Or if you're in a place like uh, Manhattan, you can't even get the trucks in and out of the stores very easily, Centralized probably is better than decentralized, but most, most of the time decentralized is the way to go on a cost basis. Okay. 
don't build displays, you're in the business of selling stuff. I've seen managers said, let me show you this wonderful window I put together for Valentine's Day. Everything's red. Oh, wonderful, great. No, you're there to sell that stuff. Here's a store, if you take a look closely, and it may be hard from the back there, you see everything's color coded, it looks so beautiful, all the khaki, here's all the purple. Okay, that took someone time to do that. And you know, we have a few colorblind customers, but most of them know <laughs> what they're looking for, and they can find that red top if it's here or here or here. They don't mind doing that work, it's part of the hunting and adventure. Same with sizing, how many of you, don't, please don't raise your hands, I'll just laugh. <laughs> how many of you are checking the waist of every pair of pants and putting them by size of the waist on your racks? Some stores do that. They're the ones usually losing money, but they do it, okay? So, so and this is, oops, just so no one thinks you're in trouble. That's a Deseret Industries store, so good for us. Okay, so, so please, it's a beautifully displayed store. Um, where are the customers? <laughs> that would be my first question. <laughs> However, where it does make sense is on new goods. And we could spend days just talking about new goods, but if you buy some stuff that typically doesn't get donated or is impulse buys, paper goods like paper towels, uh, candy, cheap tools sell well, underwear, socks that don't get donated, those can be good uh, profit margins for you, and some of them are represented outside here, so ch please check them out, they didn't pay me to say that. Here's a case where we got socks, $3.99. They're hung right here by the pants, so it's, it's easy to find them. You even got a basket here if you want to buy a bunch, I guess. Uh, but it's a good use of an end rack. Uh, there is a question of unrelated business income tax. Now, I've worked directly with the IRS on this, and there is no number in terms of the percentage. And it's a weird, really weird way to calculate it. But what we call the safe harbor number is 15% of your inventory. That is, if 15% of your sales or less is in new goods, you're gonna be fine, you don't have to worry about paying taxes on the sale of that stuff. If it's over that, then it could be questionable. So I can talk to you about that later if you want to, but, but that's just as, as a start. So don't go overboard. We're, we're still a thrift store, we're not a new goods store. Okay, we're not a dollar store. So it's a little bit different for us. However, you can have, this is, um, these two uh, racks here, uh, displays uh, as linens and pans and things like this. Um, that's a great way, it's right by the register so you can see it. You know, sometimes our managers will spend more time worried about the theft of this stuff than about the other 90% over here because they know how many items they got that they bought for the new goods. They have no idea how much stuff is back here. So that, that's something to watch for, but um, it can really help to boost sales up and it's good quality stuff for less money Here's cookware that's on a, a rack back here that's with uh, pots and pans and glassware and so forth. Great location for it all together so you can see it. Here's um, uh, squeegees and things like that. Beach toys, that's pretty cool. It has nothing to do with the things behind it, but it's, it's isolated separately so you can see it. One area of new goods that people are getting into is mattresses. Now here's an older display. You can see it's taking up a lot of space. This, this particular store does a lot of mattress sales, which is great. <coughs> but what the same chain is going to is a sleep center with, you know, people know what a mattress looks like. You don't need to have 20 of them out there. So they have a display of it with the sizes and so forth, and they can help you pull it out of the back. A lot less retail space, probably the same amount of sales. So again, you're, you're maximizing the retail square footage to have for clothing and other things while still doing well with mattresses. And if you're not in mattresses, there's a, two or three companies out here that's selling them. You should talk to them. It, it's, it's a great service. And, and the quality is actually really good. <laughs> salvage. We could spend a week talking about salvage, but we won't. What you have to remember is it's a commodity. And this is hard to explain to your board. They can influence the price here just as much as they influence the price of bananas or gold. Okay, it works the same way. It's a global market. It has very little to do with what we do compared to the value of the U.S. dollar. That's what drives the price up and down. And tariffs and all that kind of stuff, way beyond our pay grade to figure it out. Um, but here's the thing. If Goodwill found at the time I left that the retail yield on clothing was about three bucks a pound. Salvage, and this price goes, could have changed since I started this presentation this morning, <laughs> it's 20 cents a pound. There's a lot of difference there. That's where the, the outlet stores can make sense. That's where the discounting can make sense in week three and four. That's the number difference that you're working with. So that, that's a lot of opportunity. The 20 cents is 20 cents. 
regardless of how much time and effort and love you put into it, it's going to be 20 cents or whatever it is. So here's a store, and again, Deseret Industries, you see the, the, the stuff here, it looks beautiful. They have six cash wraps, and they have three customers. <laughs> so that should tell you that they don't need a lot of that cash wrap. How, how many of you uh, like waiting in line at a store? Not many of us. But we also don't expect to have six people up there and just walk right up every time we shop, right? So somewhere there's a balance. Look at this much space here, that right at the front of the store, that could be displays of clothing or you know whatever. So um, something to keep in mind. And this is especially um, prevalent in stores where we've taken it from another retailer because the, the furniture is already there. We just have to buy the registers, which are not cheap either, by the way. The, and please keep in mind that the more money that you make, the more good we can do. So don't worry about saying, people telling, well, you're the selfish guys. You charge too much. You're only in it for the bucks. Yeah, it might feel that way, but you're still doing God's work. You're doing the work of the society by maximizing those donated goods, which gives the society that many more resources to help the poor. We don't need to be embarrassed about that. In fact, we should be proud the more money that we make. Profit's not a dirty word in any nonprofit. It shouldn't be a dirty word for the society. Okay? We can do so much more with those resources. So um, be proud about what you do. Do more of it. We know that the, the market is there. The people are willing to donate. The shoppers are willing to come to you. The only thing holding us back is us. At the very beginning of this presentation, I showed you that enormous growth in the 90s for Goodwill. Why? because they decided to grow. It wasn't the economy. It wasn't that suddenly there was a lot more stuff out there to, to, to collect. It was just a force of will to say, hey, we think we know how to do this right. Let's go do it. Some of the growth was based on competitors coming in and telling us you should do more because we're your weak, we're gonna grow. It's not too late. I'm telling you, as a CEO, I travel all the time. I see your communities and I know them from my work in Goodwill. There is room for more stores wherever you are. It's getting your board, your, your leaders to understand that this is an opportunity to monetize donated goods to do work for the society. And with that, I'll close with this nice store. This was the same store that you couldn't see from the road. Okay? But when you walk up to the store, as well as the other stores, what you see is very nice messaging about shop to help a neighbor, donate to help a neighbor, it's great mission advertising. So, and you can use your store to tell the rest of the society's mission. You can double hang clothes, but still have space on the top to tell a mission statement, or have a photo of people being helped. You can put it on your receipts, you can put it on your bags, you can have flyers that you put there, you can have buttons on your employees. Yes, you're an isolated, semi-isolated store, donated goods program but we are still part of the same mission of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. If more people are coming into our stores to see what we do, it doesn't matter that they're there to buy a pair of pants. They can still see our mission, and maybe they're gonna be the same people who put money in the poor box on Sunday, or who help you in a, they're gonna donate more often, clothing as well as money. So let's take a fresh look when you go back to your store and say, what story am I telling? Am I only telling your retail story? or am I telling the story of the society? And look for those opportunities, okay? Thank you very much. I'm gonna be here uh, in 30 seconds, I have to leave. <laughs> but I'm around, I'm around all week, you have my phone number. I love, I love talking this kind of stuff with you, it's just today's crazy. Um, see you in the bar, <laughs> see you at, at the dinners and so forth, it sounds horrible. Um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm part of you guys, okay? I come from that background, and I love talking, and I love the potential that's out there. So thank you very much for your time.